Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. So over the last year, after we've wrapped each episode of Free Thoughts, we've asked guests to tell us a bit about something that's been influential on their intellectual development. Many have listed books, teachers, thinkers. So for our end of the year episode, we've put them together for you to enjoy. I'm Peter Van Dorn, senior fellow at the Cato Institute and editor of the quarterly publication Regulation. The economist whose work has interested me most over time has nothing to do with what I do. Um, it has nothing to do with modern micro or regulation or anything of the sort. Um, his name is Avner Grief and he teaches economic history at Stanford but he's a game theorist. What he's done is taken the tools of modern game theory and applied them to what I think of as fundamental questions of economic history. And he, for example, has tried to – he's written an article way back in the JPE in the 80s uh, that was on why were Christians – first to use contracts to try to govern long-distance trade and why were Muslims did not use that? Why did Muslims not use legal mechanisms to try to deal with trade and why did Christians? And then how did that differential choice lead to very different patterns in economic development? I mean, a, 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 if you go back 600, 700 years ago, Muslim areas were at the top – Islamic areas were at the top of the heap and Christian areas were not. And then subsequent economic history has been the opposite. And Grief said, hmm, it's because the uh, Florence and the Medicis and trade and banking and all of that stuff. So how did that happen? Well, way back then, you just had horses and you put stuff on the horses and then it, it, three and a half months later or on ships, it ended up someplace very far and you had to trust everybody to work it all out and so that you didn't lose your stuff or your money. And he said, that was a real problem. <laughs> and then he works through the development of law in the uh, – by Christian – traders and the medieval trade fairs that flourished in the Hanseatic League and how how did that all come about? So anyway, I mean – and he's written a number of – anyway, he's an economic historian but he um, has some game theoretic um, component to his work. And so whenever he writes an article, I just read it because I go, oh, wow. A, it's an interesting question and B, this is a thoughtful way to look at it. And it combines – I call it talky game theory. In other words, it's not the Caltech just pure math and you can't follow the proof. This is a this is a literate person who more humanistically trained people can follow what he's up to and you and you kind of read his stuff and you go, wow, this is this is an innovative, smart uh, person working on problem. And, and for me at its best and, and is what, what academia is about is that, which is smart people pl coming up with answers to very important questions and um, anyway, so that's the first name that, that comes to mind. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Nolan Brown. I'm a staff editor with Reason Magazine. One of the biggest influences to my becoming a libertarian is not necessarily any particular uh, thinker or author but was coming to an Institute for Humane Studies seminar here in D.C. And at that time, I was introduced to the Cato Institute and to Reason Magazine and uh, Reason Magazine writers and Cato Institute writers as much as any other thinkers really actually influenced my becoming a libertarian or recognizing myself as a libertarian. So um, Mark Calabri here who runs the financial regulatory area here at Cato. Uh, I will note spent uh, seven years on Capitol Hill trying to reform Fannie and Freddie as well and spent a little bit of time actually inside FHA uh, running some of the business there as well as working in a number of trade associations around town. So spent the last 20 years for better or for worse uh, monitoring mortgage markets, housing markets and mortgage finance policy. 
There are a number of people I'd certainly point to. Uh, you know, Peter Wallace and his, and, and, and his co-author Ed Pinto uh, at AEI have done a tremendous amount of work on the housing goals. Uh, now, I think there's some errors in it, but I think there are also some a lot of things that you ha- to me a central part of uh, reading for the crisis. Um, Ed Olson at UVA is probably uh, the uh, best author on rental housing, which we didn't cover at all. So if you want to learn all about public housing, uh, Ed Olson is the man to go to and learn from. Um, John Weicker over at the Hudson Institute is certainly one of the better urban economists. A uh, number of good writers in urban economics. Ed Glazer is probably doing some of the best work today in urban econ and housing markets. Uh, again, a whole lot of work in mortgage markets that are all, all worth looking at. I'm Scott Bullock. I'm senior attorney with the Institute for Justice. I've, of course, been influenced by a number of the great libertarian classics uh, and those have been very important books to me throughout my entire life. Uh, A book, however, that probably a lot of libertarians are not familiar with uh, is a book called The Omni-Americans by a writer called Albert Murray who just recently passed away uh, when he was in his late 90s. Albert Murray had a fascinating life. Uh, He was born in the Deep South, lived in Harlem for most of his life, wrote a lot of books about culture and about uh, music. Duke Ellington once called him the most unsquare person he had ever met. Uh, And he had a lot of very interesting things to say about America, about the constitution and also about the nature of art uh, as well. And even though his perspective was – quite different from somebody's like Ayn Rand's, they actually had a significant amount of overlap in the focus on the individual as a, an heroic being. And his book, The Omni-Americans, is a collection of essays that touches on a wide range of topics, some of them more dated from the early 1970s, but one that says a lot about the meaning of America and how we can kind of form a common cultural um, uh, consensus about issues drawing from the great diversity of American culture. It's really a fun read and I'd recommend it to that book and many other uh, books that uh, Albert Murray has written. Uh, I'm Alan Dickerson, legal director of the Center for Competitive Politics and one of the, my biggest influences was Aristotle's Politics where Aristotle talks about the fact that a city is those who live there and not the sort of you know stone structure and that when men and women come together to form organizations, they're obviously doing it because they see some public good in doing so. And I, I, I have always taken to heart that sort of very hopeful message about the, the instincts and, and rationales when people form organizations. Hi, I'm Peter Suderman and I'm a senior editor at Reason Magazine and one of the biggest influences on me as a writer uh, and just sort of as uh, in terms of thinking about the way the world works or could work is the science fiction writer Isaac Asimov. And uh, I started reading Isaac Asimov books when I was eight years old. I got the Caves of Steel uh, for, for Christmas one year. Um, it's a book. It's a a robot mystery novel, basically uh, set in a set in the far future. And um, Isaac Asimov said basically that he wanted to write an Agatha Christie book in the uh, but in the future. And that's kind of what it is. Um, but what was so great about Asimov was uh, that he had an incredible clarity of thought. Um, and was able to – clarity of thought that he was able to express in his writing. And uh, he was someone who really believed that we could think our way through our problems, um, that we could figure things out. He was a rationalist, a humanist. He was actually the president of the Humanist Society at one point. Um, and he was someone who believed that that humans – are, are good enough, smart enough, great enough to figure stuff out on their own. Um, not perfect but, but good enough and smart enough. Um, and this, sense, this sort of sensibility uh, that, that we can actually – that things are knowable and that we can, that we can figure out the world um, was really important, especially when combined with the other part of him, which was that in addition to being – uh, a rationalist, he was a futuristic dreamer and he could sort of dream about how the world would become a better place and a more interesting place. And he, and he put 
he did a very – as a writer, what he was so great at was explaining how the world is. He wrote a lot of science books but also how the world could be and how – and what problems might arise and how we might fix them. And this is what he always did in his uh, robot novels and his short stories was he would work from some scientific principle and then he would notice that the principle uh, or the system wouldn't – would have some loophole in it, some flaw. And then it was up to his usually scientist or detective heroes to figure out uh, what that loophole – how to – what that loophole was, how to work through that. And so uh, Asimov, yeah, was, was a – has been a, a really huge influence uh, on me as a writer for his clarity, for his uh, – for the clarity of his writing, for the volume of his writing. Um, he he uh, published something like 500 books. Um, in his lifetime and also for his, his wonderful ability to just sort of dream of a world of, of a world in which people have figured things out even more than we already have and have, and keep doing so and are likely to keep doing so. I'm Kevin Glass, Director of Policy and Outreach at the Franklin Center for Government and Public Integrity um, and my thing of influence is Isaiah Berlin and basically anything by Isaiah Berlin. I first read – uh, two Concepts of Liberty, which is his classic uh, positive liberty versus negative li liberty essay that a lot of people know and understand even if they haven't actually read the essay. But I got to know him more because I had a professor in college say, you know, uh, his libertarianism is, is derived from his pluralism uh, rather than flowing in the opposite direction. And so – I got to reading a little bit more about pluralism and specifically his version of it um, and it's something that I think uh, – I think that that description is accurate, that uh, you know, libertarianism is derived from a moral philosophy first and uh, it really kind of shaped me and it's basically – you know, people have different values. They want to live their lives in different ways and you, both your philosophy and your government should reflect that. Uh, this is Jim Otteson. I'm a, a teaching professor of political economy at Wake Forest University where I also direct the Center for the uh, Study of Capitalism. Um, and I wanted to mention a book that I would recommend uh, to listeners and, and readers um, who um, might not have heard of this book or if they've heard of it, maybe haven't read it or read it a long time ago. And the book is called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Um, this is a book that had a profound influence on me. Viktor Frankl was a uh, Nazi concentration camp survivor. And the book talks about um, not only his story, as, uh, his boyhood story, and then his travails in, um, in trying to survive in a concentration camp, and then ultimately uh, finding his way out of it. But um, the really inspirational part and the profound part of that book, I think, is his claim that finding meaning in life is really something that is up to each of us. It's up to me. Um, I don't get meaning from my life by looking to other people to give it to me. Um, instead, if I'm going to find meaning in my life, it has to be in something that pulls from my own identity as a person, who I am, the kinds of things I can do. And even in very difficult circumstances, including the extraordinarily difficult circumstances of something like as extreme as a concentration camp, um, it's possible, he argues anyway, um, for a person to find meaning um, and to generate a life that at the end of it um, can be seen as uh, having been worth living. Um, so I would recommend and commend that book um, as one that can help put into perspective the difficulties that each of us faces in, uh, in our lives today. Hi, this is Tim Carney, political columnist at the Washington Examiner and a visiting fellow at AEI. When I was a 22-year-old reporter, my editor Terry Jeffrey called me into his office to give me an assignment and he said, there's a government agency I just found out about. It's called the Export-Import Bank. Find out what it does and why it exists. And I said, why? Did they, did they do something bad? And he said, I'm sure they did. Anytime you have government power and the pursuit of profit intersecting like this, you're sure to find corruption. Do a little digging. So I did a little digging. I found out some of what this government was agent, what this government agency does, and for 12 years since then, I've been writing about it. Well, I'm Dan Eikenson. I'm director of the Herbert A. Stiefel Center for Trade Policy Studies here at the Cato Institute, and I have to say that uh, in the 15 years that I've been here, the what I've found to be most influencing the direction or the thrust of what I'm doing 
is uh, Frederick Bastiat and his uh, recognition that there are things that are seen and those things which are not seen. And that was popularized, of course, by, by Hazlitt in the 20th century. That notion that people are going to focus on the obvious uh, and, and not think deeply or think in the long term uh, has resonated with me. And, I, and, I, and I'm beginning to realize that this is something that needs to be expanded upon. In all of our analyses, we've got to focus on the secondary effects. We have to train people or encourage people to look uh, at, the, at the total impact of, of policy and, and, and not to be swayed by fast-talking policymakers and politicians about uh, the, uh, the benefits of some uh, expedient policy. So uh, I would recommend everybody read, read Bastiat and, and internalize what he has to say. Grover Norquist, president of Americans for Tax Reform. The writer in the literature that's probably most affected me has been Hernando de Soto's writing on, on property rights, uh, The Other Path, The Mystery of Capital. All of these make the case that what underpins America's success and other societies that have been successful is property rights. And this is what we did right uh, at the end of World War II when we occupied Japan and left and it was successful because we established property rights uh, and exactly what didn't happen in Iraq and what didn't happen in Afghanistan and hasn't happened in many other countries uh, and where we have the Arab Spring of the 60 plus people who burned themselves many to death but who burned themselves all had been expropriated. Not one of them did so complaining they didn't get to go to church often enough. They were all people that had land or their business uh, expropriated and that's what had driven them to uh, extreme uh, action and that's what didn't get fixed after the, um, the Arab Spring said, hey, we had elections. That's not why they were burning themselves. They hadn't been having elections for <laughs> years and years and years. The, but the property rights were being violated. So the importance of property rights to developing a free and open society and how it structured America – and we were learning as we went. As we went west, we got better and better at property rights. Uh, it's, why do we have energy and the rest of the world doesn't? Because people, individuals own the oil and natural gas and sand and rock and gold underneath, um, underneath their country. If the king owns it, if the state owns it, if the sovereign owns it and anybody finds it, all it means is they dig a hole in your backyard and you get nothing out of it. So you don't tell anybody about it. You're certainly not excited about it and you don't go looking for it. Um, and so I, I think it's a low taxes, immigration, and property rights are what made the United States more successful than the rest of the world and gave us a couple hundred year run where we outpaced the rest of the world. And we've gotten behind on taxes where we're not the low tax country, certainly on the way we treat businesses. Uh, on immigration, we're having a discussion about whether we should you know, turn into one of those countries that doesn't want to grow and, and prosper. Um, and thirdly, on property rights, mostly we just don't get it. I mean people don't understand that's the secret sauce that makes it work. If you want Egypt to work, don't write them a $3 billion check. Help them establish property rights. And there's – I think it's $7 trillion in dead capital that Fernando de Soto's ID that just is land that somebody's living on, it's used. But they can't borrow against it. They can't sell it. They, you know, they, it, it's tough to, to build. Uh, effectively on it because you don't have title to it, whereas we don't have that problem in most places in the United States. I'm Pete Betke, a professor of economics at George Mason University. I'm the author of a book called Living Economics. Um, when I wrote Living Economics, um, the uh, title of that book uh, has three different meanings uh, that I try to communicate to people. The first one is that uh, living economics is that economics is a living body of scientific thought. The second one is that a living body of thought is deeply rooted in its classical traditions. And then the third one is that if you get the lessons of economics, you can't help but live economics by it being a 24-7 occupation rather than just something you do as a daily job. You can't stop thinking about the puzzles of the world, why some nations are rich, other nations are poor, uh, why some nations that were poor became rich, why some nations that were rich uh, you know, become poor. And um, and so, you you know, the and the issues that are associated with that. So economics becomes uh, something that you think about all the time. So that's the meaning of the title of that book. 
But a large part of that comes uh, from my reading of Ludwig von Mises, who I consider to be the greatest economist um, that's ever ever lived. And um, and I just want to do you two readings. One of them is from the beginning of his book, Human Action, and the other one is from the very last page of Human Action. And on page seven of Human Action, Mises is sums up his position about economics as a living body of thought. He says the following: He says. It is customary for many people to blame economics for being backward. Now, it is quite obvious that our economic theory is not perfect. There is no such thing as perfection in human knowledge, nor for that matter in any other human endeavor. Omniscience is denied to man. The most elaborate theory that seems to satisfy completely our thirst for knowledge may one day be amended or supplanted by a new theory. Science does not give us absolute and final certainty. It gives us assurances within the limits of our mental abilities and the prevailing state of scientific thought. A scientific system is but one way station in an endlessly progressing search for knowledge. It is necessarily affected by the insufficiencies inherent in every human effort. But to acknowledge these facts does not mean that present day economics is backward. It merely means that economics is a living thing and to live implies both imperfection and change. This is, I take as the motto of my book in the sense that I see Mises as offering economic science as an open invitation to inquiry. Economics is this golden key that unlocks the mysteries of the universe. And our job as economic educators is to share that key with as many people as we possibly can. And the stakes of sharing that key are extremely high. So you turn to the very last page of human action. So that was on page seven. On page 881, after this consistent and persistent application of economic reasoning to all walks of life, Mises sums up his ideas and says the following. The body of economic knowledge is an essential element in the structure of human civilization. It is the foundation upon which modern industrialism and all the moral, intellectual, technological, and therapeutic achievements of the last centuries have been built. It rests with men whether they will make the proper use of the rich treasure with which this knowledge provides them or whether they will leave it unused. But if they fail to take advantage, uh, uh, excuse me, if they fail to take the best advantage of it, and disregard the teachings and warnings. They will not annul economics. They will stamp out society and the human race. The stakes are very, very high in this battle of economic education. So economics is the most entertaining subject out there, but it's also the most vital and important subject out there. And the goal of the economic educator, in my mind, is to make sure that they communicate clearly and forcefully the teachings of economics And that's a very worthy vocation. I'm Steve Horowitz, Charles A. Dana Professor of Economics at St. Lawrence University. I want to talk about a person and a book who have influenced me in in my thinking. And and what's interesting about them is that I came across them at roughly the same time. Um, The book would be uh, Friedrich Hayek's Law, Legislation and Liberty, particularly the second volume of that. It's a trilogy. The second volume of that has a chapter – in there where Hayek talks about uh, the, what he calls the catalaxy. And the catalaxy is Hayek's word for the idea of the market as this sort of nexus of exchange and undesigned order. And that – when I first – I can recall first reading that chapter and having one of those moments where you – where you all of a sudden – all of the ways in which you've thought about how markets work and about how we talk about markets and about the idea of, of, of where uh, – how people get – remunerated markets and what the justice of that is and all these questions that we think are so important. All of a sudden, someone has just sort of peeled away the the, 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 the wrapper and you see it in a very different way than before. And this notion that he really emphasizes in there that in the market economy, people are are rewarded not for their merit, not for their skill in a pure sense of the word skill, but for their creation of value and that we can't predict the pattern of incomes and we can't control the pattern of incomes because it is this ongoing evolutionary process that's based on people's attempting to guess what other people want. And the, and the way it's – the whole discussion in that chapter, chapter 10 of the trilogy about the way in which markets do this is just uh, – Every paragraph has something in it where you want to go, wow, that's, <laughs> that's, that's what – that's uh, – that changes the way I think about something. And for me, reading that chapter, I have, the, I have the original copy of the book with my notations in it when I was still making notes in pen, which I don't do anymore. But going back to – I probably read it I th- read it in graduate school and I'm like there's all these little stars and stuff in there, right, where I can't – I don't have the words to put in the margin about kind of how it's making me think. 
So that book, but I, I read that book at the same time. As I said, I was in graduate school and I had the opportunity in graduate school to work with a uh, professor at George Mason at the time, Don Lavoie. Uh, Don unfortunately passed away in 2001 at the age of 50, uh, a year younger than I am now, which is somewhat distressing. Um, but Don was an uh, uh, amazing person. He was a scholar. He wrote two books that every libertarian should read, especially his National Economic Planning, What is Left, which you can find on, online, I believe, at Cato. Um, also his Rivalry and Central Planning book, which is sort of the more scholarly version. Both of those were arguments about the limits of economic planning and how markets work and they're fantastic pieces, especially the National Economic Planning book was, a, was Don's attempt to reach out to the left and talk to them about – why they shouldn't be planners uh, by their own by their own values, and Don was also a tremendous teacher, uh, and and uh, had enormous patience with graduate students. Don also was ahead of his time in the classroom. I believe Don Lemoy was the first human being I ever heard use the word hypertext, and this would have been in the late 80s, early 90s, before anyone was really talking about this. And Don could see right then this idea of being able to click through a document to other documents and, and to leave – for students to collaborate on a document and leave comments. He was doing this stuff in the 90s on the most primitive technology with Lotus Notes and things like that. So Don was, an, a, was a creative teacher who, who understood – the application of his intellectual ideas about knowledge and collaboration and sharing and the importance of accessing other people's knowledge and recognize how it worked in the classroom. And so much of my career as an economist and now as a public intellectual, I think is has been about pushing forward the ideas and values that that Don had. And I think it's a shame that Don didn't live to see where the libertarian intellectual movement, where things like Students for Liberty and all of these organizations have gone today because he would have been just thrilled beyond belief and, and he would have adored the directions that, that, that things have gone in and the growth and, and in some ways intellectual successes we've had. And so um, you know, I hope that me and, and, and Don's other students are, are continuing that legacy uh, into the 21st century. Uh, my name is Bruce Benson. I'm a – in an economist, uh, a professor at Florida State University. Um, and my main uh, focus in my research is uh, on the interplay between law and the economy. Um, and in this context, uh, I have uh, been very interested in looking at the development of uh, law and legal institutions. Um, one of the uh, really significant influences in my thinking about uh, this process uh, is provided by uh, Hayek's law legislation, Liberty, uh, especially the uh, it's that's a three volume uh, set of books, uh, all of them quite small. Uh, the first volume is just tremendous. Um, it is a uh, it provides a picture of evolving law uh, and and the processes through which law can evolve um, rather than the sort of static way we think of law today uh, as just being there and all these institutions are there um, we can think about law uh, and how it came about um, and, and its different sources, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, emphasis he puts on uh, sort of discovered law as opposed to uh, designed law is is crucial, I think, for people to understand uh, the legal process. Uh, he, uh, of course. Uh, recognizes, as we all do, that uh, governments today try to design law. They create law and they impose it from the top down. Um, but that uh, typically causes all sorts of uh, additional problems uh, as people try to circumvent uh, those designed rules. On the other hand, uh, law that is discovered um, – as individuals interact or perhaps as judges uh, uh, are looking for ways to resolve disputes um, is uh, generally uh, applies 
uh, to those individuals involved, perhaps in the dispute, and it only spreads if it's good law um, and is accepted by others. Um, the, uh, the design law is imposed on everyone, uh, and whereas uh, uh, discovered law uh, is a slower process of finding the best rules um, and uh, uh, developing uh, a consistent set of rules uh, that uh, make sense um, as opposed to the sort of random designing of rules uh, to do all sorts of different things and then you end up with lots of inconsistencies and, and conflicts between uh, rules and so on. Um, so uh, that's been, been a, a real uh, important influence on my thinking. Uh, actually, when I was writing my book, The Enterprise of Law, one of the first uh, reviewers of an early volume was Randy Barnett. Um, and uh, he, uh, one of the points he made in his review was that my discussion sounds very Hayekian, he said, but you don't cite Hayek. Uh, where's Hayek? Um, and my response uh, was, uh, you know, uh, who's Hayek? My graduate program in economics never talked about Hayek. Uh, and so I started reading Hayek, and it was just a, an eye-opener, uh, and uh, particularly law, legislation, liberty. But, of course, uh, his, his wonderful uh, article on, on how prices work and uh, knowledge in society and so on, uh, it just uh, was a, a tremendous uh, learning experience for me. I always thank Randy for that uh, insight. I'm Dan Mitchell. I'm a senior fellow here at the Cato Institute. Probably the most formative book from my younger years, which were quite a long time ago, back in the late 1970s, uh, was written by Bill Simon, who was Gerald Ford's Secretary of the Treasury. He wrote the book, I believe, in 1978. So, of course, Jimmy Carter was in the White House and, and he was a, a free agent, at least politically at the time. Uh, and A Time for Truth, the reason it influenced me, it's the first time I ever found a publication that in some sort of comprehensive way made the case uh, for smaller government, a less intrusive, less destructive tax system and, and for sort of an unfocused mind like mine. I had sort of gotten interested in public policy because of the Reagan challenge against Gerald Ford in 1976. Bill Simon's book uh, enabled me to, to have a more coherent worldview. It enabled me to sort of put the pieces together, you know, such as I was at the time. I'm sure there were lots of holes in my thinking. There probably still are now. Uh, but Bill Simon's book, I remember reading it more than once because I said, wow, this really all makes sense to me. My name is Andrew I. Cohen. I'm an associate professor of philosophy at Georgia State University in Atlanta. And I also direct the Gene Beer Blumenfeld Center for Ethics there. If we were to think about one important inspiration in my career and in my thinking, I would trace it back to a very influential social studies teacher that I had when I was in high school. It was a fellow named Anthony Panino, and he would begin all of his classes with something that he called the freedom unit. And in the freedom unit, he would introduce people to a whole bunch of ideas, particularly sort of philosophical approach to thinking about what freedom might mean and what the proper role of government might be. And one of the important themes that came out of that unit, which went on for uh, quite a bit, was the notion that freedom is potentially best understood as independence. Panino would always wrap up his freedom units by having students do a book report. And I recall the first time I, I studied with him, he had people read a book by Ayn Rand called Anthem. And I remember reading that and being very impressed with the picture of the power of individuality and understanding how it is that people can relate to one another in a way that might allow them to rethink current norms. And that opened me to a whole new way of thinking, a whole philosophical way of thinking. And after that, I went on to the study of academic philosophy, and this opened the door to a whole new field for me. I began to become exposed to more mainstream and rigorous philosophers when I went to college and later to graduate school. 
And there I began to read people such as Aristotle and uh, Robert Nozick and John Locke. All of these people were very influential and profound in helping me to rethink how it is that I understand the individual, the individual's role in society and the proper scope of state power. This is Mike Munger. I'm the director of the philosophy, politics, and economics program at Duke University. My PhD is in economics, but I've been teaching in political science programs now for 30 years. The person who influenced me most, uh, particularly recently, is James Buchanan, who won the Nobel Prize in economics in 1986 and is one of the founders of the public choice movement. Buchanan always famously said that there are three elements to public choice. There's methodological individualism where we look partly in philosophical terms because people have autonomy but also just as a matter of practicality, people in, act individually. They make individual choices. So we start with individuals. Then the second is those individuals – are more or less the same in terms of their motivation, their moral capacity, regardless of whether they're acting at the supermarket or in the voting booth. That's, that's called behavioral symmetry. The third, and people lose sight of this, but it was very important for Buchanan's thought, the third is politics as exchange. And that is groups of us acting together can be better off than any individual could be acting alone. There are many social cooperative activities that require us to be able to write binding contracts where people are coerced if they fail to live up after giving consent to the terms of that agreement. And I think Buchanan's particular genius was to recognize that there are non-market institutions. We can call them political, but they need not be the state. So private clubs, nonprofit organizations, all of the rich tapestry that gives us society – that's a kind of third element, something that's different from market institutions but it's different from the coercive institutions of the state where coercion, t coercion takes place without consent. So understanding and trying to extend Jim Buchanan's insights has been – has occupied much of the last 10 years of my scholarly activity. Michael Tanner, senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Uh, I would say that the book that really – got me thinking most was actually Charles Murray's Losing Ground and it did it for two reasons. One was it exposed me to a very different way of thinking about welfare, not that people were somehow taking advantage of the program or that they were welfare queens or anything like that, but that they were reacting to natural incentives within the program, that poor people uh, weren't lazy but they weren't stupid and uh, essentially they simply reacted to the incentives like everyone else. And second, I think more than any other book, it taught me the value of hard science as applied to social policy. That it said that it wasn't just about politics or emotion or things like that, that you actually could apply scientific methods to these things and deal with st uh, this numbers and logic and come to a conclusion. And that made me that, – that really helped get me into the whole public policy arena. My name is John Goodman. I'm president of the Goodman Institute for Public Policy Research, which is a think tank. Uh, I've been very involved in health policy for many, many years and I'm often called the father of health savings accounts. Health economics is a particular interest to me. But the one book that most influenced how I think about public policy uh, was Milton Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom. And it was in that book that I really began to appreciate the economic way of thinking because as Milton Friedman works his way through economic problems, public education, health care, he's always talking about these problems uh, using the language of economics. He's, he thinks like an economist and he talks about occupational licensing, whether we need to regulate uh, who can be a doctor and who shouldn't and makes a very obvious point. Well, look, if we're worried uh, that uh, people will be practicing medicine who don't have the skills, the government doesn't need to go out there and regulate the market. Government just needs to certify people. So if, if a surgeon is a skilled surgeon, the government uh, can say so. Uh, but then we're free to ignore the government's advice because the government isn't always right. Um, that was a very uh, insightful way to analyze the whole subject of occupational licensing. As Friedman pointed out, uh, the licensing boards tend to be controlled by the professions being licensed. And so therefore they function like a cartel agent to uh, increase the incomes of the people they're supposed to be regulating uh, at the public expense. So Friedman, who I knew personally by the way, uh, influenced me a great deal. Uh, he taught me how to think like an economist 
and uh, a lot that I learned from Milton Friedman, I've applied to an area that he really didn't think that much about, and that is health care. I'm Christopher Preble, the Vice President for Defense and Foreign Policy Studies at the Cato Institute. Um, two recent books that I've read that I have used in the class that I teach on foreign policy that I recommend to others. The, the first is Fried Zakaria's book, The Post-American World. It's actually been in two versions. So the new one is called Post-American World 2.0. And I think Fried Zakaria has a very important, subtle uh, understanding of both the limits and the uh, the extent of American power. Uh, and, he, and he does appreciate both. Right. This is a man who came to the United States from India as a, as a young adult um, and, and just has enormous respect and appreciation for this country and all that it's done. But he also has, I think, a, a somewhat removed sense of our limitations and, and how sometimes when we act abroad, how it's interpreted elsewhere. And I think it's, a, it's an excellent book and I've, and I've recommended it and I guess I've used it in my class for a number of years. Another book that is just out by Ian Bremmer called Superpower um, is the book that I'm now using in my class uh, uh, now that the Zakaria book is now – it's a little dated. Um, and Bremmer does I think a truly commendable job of spelling out three different uh, archetypes of US foreign policy, a different vision for how the United States should conduct itself overseas, abroad, etc. And these are quite distinct and he makes a very good case for each of them on their own terms, the pros and the cons. But at the end of the day, he weighs, uh, weighs in and ultimately comes down on the side of what he calls independent America with some caveats. But basically arguing that, that the United States and the world would be better off if the United States did somewhat less, encouraged others to do somewhat more and become more focused on improving ourselves here at home and a bit less uh, focused on trying to nation build abroad. Um, it's a it's a quick read. It's uh, he's an excellent writer, uh, and I think would be of interest to people who do not follow foreign policy issues on a day to day basis. I'm Catherine Mangu Ward, managing editor of Reason Magazine, and one of the most influential cultural products that I've ever consumed was uh, presented to me in my my public school, my government school, dare I call it, uh, when I was in middle school, which was the John Stossel special in which he utters his trademark line, could greed be good? And, uh, you know, it's easy to sort of laugh at the simplicity of that idea. But as someone who had very recently encountered uh, Ayn Rand and who otherwise had almost no exposure to economics or really philosophy of any kind, it was fascinating to have this TV wheeled in and a VHS tape put into it and to have this mustachioed man of mystery tell me that something that I had always been told was bad could actually be a kind of a virtue. So I'm going to make the perhaps uh, overthought case for John Stossel Classroom Specials. Hi, I'm Andrew Jason Cohen, uh, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Georgia State University and currently visiting Professor of Ethics at the McDonough Business School at Georgetown University. So um, I've been asked to talk about influential thinkers or figures. Um, very difficult question because there are so many of them. Um, and I'm fortunate that I had some time to think about it first. And I'm not going to narrow it down to one. I'm going to narrow it down to one teacher and one historical thinker. The historical thinker for me should be the obvious choice of John Stuart Mill because I take the harm principle from him and I've been working on using the harm principle as the main or only normative principle of toleration. Uh, Mill is a liberal in the classical sense, although he also sits at a juncture in history where things get pushed further than previous classical liberals I think would have liked. So he, he's moving away in some ways from John Stuart Mill. On the other hand, he's also a great economist um, with some exceptions uh, but I think very, very important thinker historically speaking. I think perhaps the most important political philosopher of the 19th century. Certainly the only, the only competition really is Karl Marx who of course I think was wrong about far more. Uh, so that's that's the philosopher or theorist that I would name, and then I'll I'll name one teacher. Um, in my time at uh, at Emory University as an undergrad, uh, my first major was economics, and I was very fortunate that E. G. West was visiting at Emory for a while, 
and I took a class uh, from him on the history of economic thought. And that was really important to me. He, he was also a very interesting thinker and it was great to take the class from him. But it was a really Im important uh, juncture for me because it got me to see that what I really enjoyed about economics was the theoretical side of it, not the mathematical side that has become the dominant view of, of, of economics. And once I realized that, I realized I should really move more into studying philosophy directly. So I think that was really important for my development. I'm Matt Zwolinski. I'm a professor of philosophy at the University of San Diego. I work in, uh, in political philosophy and uh, with a specific uh, recent interest in the intellectual history of libertarianism. I've uh, been writing a book uh, with my uh, colleague John Tomasi um, which attempts to trace the origins of libertarian thought um, back as far as we can go. Uh, and our, uh, our finding is that uh, libertarianism as a kind of distinct political ideology really sprung into existence around the middle of the 19th century in Britain and France. Uh, it's a, so it's a much older doctrine than many people think. A lot of people associate libertarianism with Ayn Rand and Robert Nozick and Murray Rothbard, these kind of mid-20th century American thinkers. And, and those are all really important figures and they've, they've all had a profound influence on me. But um, reading some of these 19th century libertarians has, has really opened my eyes to um, just how, uh, how, how common – Certain common themes keep cropping up again and again in the libertarian intellectual tradition and, and just how beautifully and forcefully they were sometimes expressed at a, at a relatively early stage. One of the uh, things that I'm, I'm most happy to have read in the course of researching this book is Herbert Spencer's 1851 book, Social Statics, which in many ways is probably the first systematic libertarian treatise by which I mean it's a book that sets forward a kind of master libertarian principle, one basic moral principle that we can then apply to all the different problems of government and society and then kind of works through those problems and shows how that principle applies, what insights it gives us and what direction it points us to in terms of future reform. So Herbert Spencer's basic principle was the law of equal freedom which says that basically everybody ought to have as much freedom as is compatible with a similar freedom for others. It's a fairly straightforward principle um, at least uh, on first glance. Um, uh, and then he goes through a whole range of issues and talks about what that entails and you get some really surprising conclusions, really radical and, and surprisingly progressive conclusions from that principle. So for instance, there's a chapter in the book on the rights of children where Spencer makes the case that essentially uh, children should have all the same rights as adults, um, that we don't have any good grounds for withholding um, uh, the rights of freedom of movement, rights of freedom of contract, even political rights from children um, that we would extend to adults. Uh, the same is true of women. There's a chapter in the book on the rights of women where Spencer decries um, the, the kind of patriarchal nature of, uh, of English society and really the world at the time uh, uh, and not just in a political sense either, right? It's not just that he thinks that it's wrong for governments to deny women the kind of political rights that they afford to men, the right to own property, the right to vote. Uh, but even in a kind of broader social sense, right? Spencer makes the case in that chapter that within the family, um, relationships ought to be governed by a kind of spirit of equality and that it's wrong for husbands to kind of dominate over their wives and to rule over them as as you know as a tyrannical lord might rule over his subjects um so it's it's interesting to see libertarianism uh, for Spencer, sort of coming out of just the narrowly political realm and into the broader broader social realm as well, uh, there's a really interesting chapter in there on property rights. Um, there's some great stuff on imperialism. Again, Spencer has a, uh, a, a kind of beautifully, I think, progressive view on on imperialism, where he says, "Look, just because somebody lives in a different country from you doesn't mean they have any less rights than you. Um, and if it's wrong for you to go." violently plunder your neighbor. It's wrong for you to go violently plunder somebody else living abroad even if you make the claim that it's uh, it's for their own good. So I think you know, it's just there's, there's a lot of really neat 
um, examples in the book to dig into, a lot of different controversies to dig into. Uh, there's some really kind of heavy-hitting philosophy at the beginning where he tries to come up with an argument for the principle of equal freedom, um, several different arguments actually, one kind of utilitarian argument, another based in moral sentiments. Um, uh, so you, you get you get both the sort of you know, theoretical political philosophy and the applied political philosophy. Uh, there's a lot of in arguments, some of which are, I guess, transparently bad. But even the bad arguments are ones that uh, that I I came away from glad having read and, and learned something from. So it's it's an underappreciated book. Uh, Spencer used to be a kind of giant intellectually, uh, kind of uh, this massive public intellectual that anybody who had any pretense of, of being an intelligent uh, person would be familiar with. And then at the beginning part of the 20th century, he just sort of dropped off the face of the earth. Uh, G. E. Moore accused him of committing the naturalistic fallacy in his ethics uh, and that kind of doomed him with academic philosophers. And Richard Hofstetter accused him of being a social Darwinist. And, and between those two accusations, basically everybody stopped reading Spencer. Turns out neither of those accusations was very well grounded. Um, so so Spencer's starting to enjoy something of a renaissance among uh, among academics now, uh, and uh, and I hope that continues. He's really uh, uh, worth reading and, and a lot of fun to read. This is George H. Smith, the co-editor with Marilyn Moore of Individualism, a Reader, an anthology of individualist writings that was recently published by Libertarianism.org. Previous to that, I wrote a book published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, titled The System of Liberty, Themes in the History of Classical Liberalism. I've been active in the libertarian movement for, well, since about 1968 or 69 when I was in college. And I wanted to say something about the influence of Ayn Rand on my intellectual development. Now, I realize that she's a very famous writer. I don't need to really go into her ideas. But one thing that's disturbed me a bit in recent years is the sort of disdain toward Rand that is sometimes shown by especially academics, whether in philosophy, well, especially in philosophy. And it's true that Rand wasn't an academic philosopher. She didn't write, with one exception, her introduction to objectivist epistemology, didn't write anything really technical in philosophy. She was an essayist. But there's a grand tradition of philosophical essayists in the history of Western thought, Montaigne being one, and many others. And she was a great writer. Uh, the th way it influenced me was Rand, when I first read her, uh, probably in my third year in high school. She's the one, quite apart from her ideas, who first got me interested in philosophy. She wrote about philosophy with such passion and made it seem so important that it, it made it important to me. Before that, I was vaguely interested in ideas, but not generally, just in certain areas. And she convinced me that, that philosophy really was very important. It, it set sort of the fundamental themes throughout the history of Western civilization. And to understand philosophy even highly abstract philosophy, in many ways, is the key to understanding the development of Western civilization. Uh, that's number one. The second thing that interested me and that, that caught my eye was her intense passion for individual freedom. Uh, she really believed it. And some people will say, well, she went over the top in her things about altruism and such. Well, be that as it may, and that's part of her charm. Uh, she, she, if she was eccentric at times, she was an original eccentric. She, she forged her own path. And when I, the more I learned about Rand, the more I had to admire her. Here was a woman who came over from Russia at an early age, spoke very little English, taught herself English, worked in various jobs, uh, started writing. And at, an, at a time when the climate was very hostile to any free market or libertarian ideas, a time when you have all these uh, pro-Russia, so pro-Soviet people running around, and she stuck it out. And sometimes I've heard people complain, well, you know, she was intolerant and she, was, uh, she could get very dogmatic. And I'd say, you know, if she didn't have those qualities, she never would have made it. She would have been eaten up by that culture. And it's a survival of the fittest thing. And only a very determined, tough, and being a woman on top of it. If, if anyone should be a heroine to feminist, Ayn Rand should be. She had all of this against her. Uh, and she stuck it out and achieved a remarkable uh, career. So I just want to tip my hat to Ayn Rand. Uh, I must say I disagree with some of her ideas, uh, but I just admire the woman tremendously. And I think that people who get highly educated in philosophy should uh, cut her some slack. Um, her ideas were basically good, and uh, she expressed them in essay form, not in technical treatises, but she considered herself primarily a novelist. 
But the essays she did write, I think, are very, very good on the whole. Fleming Rose, uh, author of The Tyranny of Silence, How One Cartoon Ignited a Global Debate on Free Speech, um, foreign affairs editor at the Danish newspaper Jyllands Posten. Um, well, I would say that um, there are two books that made a huge impression on me when it comes to um, free speech, censorship, uh, self-censorship and the things we've been talking about. And the one is uh, the memoirs of uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, a famous Russian writer who received the Nobel, um, Nobel Prize for Literature in, 90, in 1971. 1970 or 1971. Um, um, he wrote a book called uh, The Calf and the Oak, um, about his fight with Soviet authorities to get his things published. And um, he he was arrested at the end of uh, the Second World War when he was in the Red Army in 1945, and he spent eight years in a labor camp uh, in, in Kazakhstan, in Central Asia. And... Um, And when he came out of uh, jail or, or labor camp, he uh, he had to live in exile, and and he started to write, and he was teaching in a, in a school, and uh, at that time he he anticipated that everything he wrote would never be published in his lifetime, so he was in effect writing for eternity, um, and in order to preserve his texts. He um, he uh, he he learned by heart the texts, uh, and then he um, he uh, hid them in his backyard uh, in in the soil, uh, and he would he would on a regular basis uh, burn manuscripts and then learn them by heart. So he and he was always living with the conscience uh, that uh, you know I'm never going to be published. Uh, you know, to to uh, to write, uh, and at the same time, be of the conviction that what I'm writing is never going to get published while I'm alive, and that I have to cover uh, everything up. Uh, I have to burn my manuscripts, you know, every second month, and find uh, spaces where I can hit them. I mean, um, uh, you really have to, uh, you know. Be stubborn uh, and believe in what you're doing. Uh, why not just go about your regular life and and teach in school and uh, so 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 um, and and I had a similar experience with uh, um, Nadezhda Mandelstam, the wife of a of a Russian poet who was uh, who died in labor camp in 1938, and she traveled for decades with uh, with his manuscripts and saved them for history. And she wrote a memoir in 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 the sixties about this, and and these two books, um, um, I mean, they 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 made a huge impression on me because they showed the importance of words, and and how much power and influence uh, the written word can have. And and how much people are willing to sacrifice in order to save these words, and 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 both in the case of Mandelstam and Solzhenitsyn, I mean, they are recognized uh, uh, titans of uh, of Russian literature today. Uh, but very easily, everything you know, we 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 may not never have known about them uh, if things maybe have went a little bit different than it actually did. I'm Trevor Burris. I'm a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies and the managing editor of the Cato Supreme Court Review. I've done libertarianist stuff for quite a while since I was a teenager and a, and a preteen to some extent. And for me, the books that really influenced my early thinking and then set me on a path were a bunch of Thomas Sowell books, including uh, A Conflict of Visions. The Vision of the Anointed and his basic economics textbook, which is now in its fifth edition and is about four times bigger than it was originally. 
So I read those now and and they're not as important, of course, as they as they were to me then. But at the time, looking at political debates and not really understanding why the debates were happening or why people were so angry about these issues in such a way and there seemed to be so little actual factual evidence there that was mustered. I read a book like Conflict Divisions and suddenly the reality of political debate made a lot of sense. The fact that there were certain types of people who viewed the world in one way and there were other people who viewed the world in a different way and that was a way of looking at the background of political beliefs because for me that has always been a huge question of why do people have their political beliefs aside from the facts because it seems like the facts don't really matter uh, as it comes for either side of the political debate. Uh, there's a, always a sort of bias in a worldview question in there. And then the question of why certain political beliefs travel together. Why is it that you can see what someone thinks about environmentalism and probably predict what they think about other things? I think this has been an underexplored topic, more explored now than it was when Thomas Sowell wrote A Conflict of Visions. And a vision of the anointed helped me look into the what he calls the self congratulations as a basis for public policy, which was his thesis that there's a group of people out there who just don't really care about the outcomes of their public policy preferences. They care more about how they seem when they promote them. So they they look moral if they promote a bigger welfare state or if they promote a minimum wage and they seem to not really care about the outcomes of those. And the basic economics textbook is one that everyone should read. It has the most boring cover and title ever. But if you are unfamiliar with economics, it is just about the most exciting book if you're of the temper temperament who you like to puncture uh, people's uh, – prevailing wisdoms and learn about the basic concept of economics as applied to public policy and get a good toolkit for thinking about public policy in the real world and how it works. Hi, I'm Aaron Powell, editor of libertarianism.org, a research fellow at the Cato Institute and co-host of Free Thoughts. And as co-host, I think I'm going to take – exercise my authority to list two influential things. The first, which is what got me on this long path to where I am today, is actually – and this is kind of maybe a little cheesy – my co-host, Trevor Burris. Trevor and I met when I was maybe a sophomore in college. We met in a sci-fi literature course um, and at that time, I was I guess not extraordinarily political but my political views ran fairly typical – campus left and this being the University of Colorado at Boulder, that was pretty left. Um, and Trevor and I became friends. He argued with me a lot, offered a lot of book recommendations and over time brought me around to libertarianism. So I wouldn't be here at Cato today if it weren't for those conversations, those many days standing in the philosophy section at Barnes & Noble talking far longer than we should have being that both of us had homework. Um, so my first influential thing has to be Trevor. The second one though, the one that is probably the most influential on my thinking today and the way that I approach politics, the way that I approach moral issues is a book by the philosopher Rosalind Hursthaus called On Virtue Ethics. Um, I stumbled across this book maybe five years ago uh, and virtue ethics it, – it opened virtue ethics up to me. This is a moral theory fairly distinct from the, the two that are more familiar to most of us, the, the notion of consequentialism that says it's always right. The right thing to do is always that which produces the best consequences and then the the alternative theory of deontology which says morality is a system of rules and your duty is to follow those rules. Whatever is morally right is that which aligns with the, the system of rules. Um, and virtue ethics, when I encountered it and when coming into it familiar with really those two moral systems was, was this enormously fresh and rich idea that said that morality was not so much about what's the right thing to do, although that's important, but more what kind of person we ought to be. And for me, it felt far more compelling. It felt far more compatible with how I understand human experience 
Um, it said that morality is ultimately about living a good life and it's about those behaviors and beliefs and traits of character that are conducive to a good life properly understood. And it was Hearst House book that made that real for me, that filled it in. It's a, it's a difficult system to get your mind around at first, especially if you're mostly familiar with the the two with the more standard systems of consequentialism and deontology and and Hearst House book while I've come to disagree with some of her conclusions remains the text that that made this real set me on this path that I have found profoundly rich and profoundly rewarding thank you for listening free thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel to learn more find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org